Berkeley, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, and 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz. Also online all the time at kpfa.org. It's now 7 p.m. Stay tuned for Chris Welch and special fun drive program. The following program is pre-recorded. I am so happy that we have the film, uh, namely uh, about Ramdas becoming nobody. There, are the, there's the six CD set that we have. I beg your pardon, the five CD set that we have offered and we are offering again. But finally, we have this film of the same name, becoming nobody, and. I saw it yesterday, and it's so wonderful. And it has so much stuff in it that is not in the five CD set. Just because you've got, you've got him interacting with people and and in conversation, and and it's 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 sort of a biography. So it goes over lots of different scenes and and times and facial hair and. <laughs> <laughs> all that stuff. It's just a wonderful, wonderful movie. So, I would like to offer you this hour, this DVD, Becoming Nobody, for a $100 donation to KPFA or $10 a month. And we're going to still be offering you the five CD set, which has got a lot more of his teachings in it. Uh, that's uh, for $200 or $20 a month. All when you call 1-800-439-5732, 1-800-439-KPFA, and online at kpfa.org. It's a, it's, it's a fab film. Let's just start and hear some of it. Oh, I want to tell you, first of all, because I don't want to not make this match, that we already are starting off with $660 on the line so that anything you... Uh, donate to KPFA right now is doubled by Linda in San Rafael and Ava in Castro Valley. So 660 bucks worth of inspiration and challenge from Linda and Ava to people who may not have donated yet to KPFA. And I am delighted to be able to offer you such a wonderful, wonderful thank you gift in the form of this DVD or the five CD set that the teachings are invaluable. The DVD, once again, $100 or $10 a month. Uh, the DVD collection, five CDs, I beg your pardon, the CD collection, five CDs, is $200 or $20 a month. 1-800-439-5732. 1-800-HEY-KPFA or online at kpfa.org. Here we go into the film. Okay, we're going to do this song. Now, um, even if you don't sing, it's okay. You're going to sing it. It's got three words to it, and I'll sing the song. Now, listen so you don't screw up. We're going to do it in six parts, but we got to learn it first. Jubilate Deo, Jubilate Deo, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. We're going to take a little higher. Okay, now we're going to do it in six parts. Now, and it gets really far out. All right, you ready? One, two, three, four, five, six. Here we go. Mm. Jube, 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 jube. For 25 years now, I have been huffing and puffing and trying to get enlightened as hard as I could. I have fasted and prayed, mantraed, pilgrimaged, sat before my guru, done all night this isn't that, meditated with real meditators. I mean, I really put my time in, so to speak. And two things have been surprising to me. One is a year ago, I met one of my old Harvard colleagues and after a few minutes he said, you know, Dick, you haven't changed a bit. <laughs> interesting one is that 
many of us have been through so many stages of this journey at this point. We're all still relative beginners, but you see all these lines like we're at the beginning or there's a path or we're near the end. These are all astral storylines. How do we know who we are? We might be one breath away from enlightenment or death or who knows. The uncertainty is great. It just keeps it wide open. Twenty years ago, when I first met you, it was a retreat in England in an old boarding school in 94. And I think you were interested in why someone so young was on the retreat. And I said, I think I've come all this way for you to tell me that I'm a good son. And you just smiled at me and you looked and you went, of course, you went, what are you? <laughs> <laughs> what do you come here for then? I came here to say thank you, I love you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I told you to get the keys to the executive washroom of spirituality. <laughs> born, I donned a space suit for living on this plane. It was this body. This is my space suit. And it had a steering mechanism, my prefrontal lobes, and all the brain motors coordinating stuff. And just like those Rusty Schweiger and the others that go to the moon and they wear their uniforms and they learn how to grab things and lift things. So I did that. You know, I learned my prehensile capacities. And I got rewarded. I get You get little stars and kisses and all kinds of things when you learn how to use your spacesuit. And you get really good at it. You get so good at using your spacesuit that you can't differentiate yourself from your spacesuit anymore. And everybody comes up and says, what a nice suit. And you're constantly looking into other people's eyes to find out if you're really wearing a nice spacesuit. It's what I call somebody training. When you're born, you go into somebody training because your parents know who they are and they're going to make you somebody too. My parents were very intent on making me somebody. They wanted me to achieve, be responsible, be healthy, be successful, bring pride to them. And if it didn't interfere with any of those, I should be happy. The problem that I experienced, though, was that the suit that I was wearing, it was like you're in a, one of these suits that doesn't quite fit, and you're a little uncomfortable, and you're constantly trying to readjust yourself. But everybody kept saying, beautiful suit, really impressive suit. You must be very happy. But I wasn't. Now, if everybody you look into their eyes, and they tell you you're happy, and you're not, because the suit feels so weird, what do you conclude? I felt when everybody said what a nice suit I was wearing that I must be sick. So I went to an analyst. Now he was wearing another kind of weird suit. See? What he did was he said that for a pittance he would teach me how to wear his suit instead of my suit. So I learned how to wear his suit, which had even more status connect. I mean, more people said beautiful suit. And I really wasn't very happy in that suit either. And you walk down the street and you're somebody. You say, you know who you are. You dress like somebody. Your face looks like somebody. Everything is somebody. Nuts. Everybody is reinforcing their structure of the universe over and over again. And they meet like two huge things meeting. This is who I am. This is who you are. And we enter in these conspiracies. I'll make believe you are who you think you are. If you make believe I am who I think I am. And we just kind of bump against each other. You can see them in everybody. I mean, everybody's busy being somebody now in our culture we've been trained for individual differences to stand out so you look at each person immediately it is brighter dumber older younger richer poorer and we make all these dimensional dis distinctions put them in categories and treat them that way and we get so that we only see others as separate from ourselves in the ways in which they're separate 
And one of the dramatic characteristics of the psychedelic experience is being with another person and suddenly seeing the ways in which they are like you, not different from you. In the 60s, in March 6, 1961 to be exact, Timothy Leary gave me psilocybin, and it changed my life. It changed my life in the sense that it undercut the models I had of who I thought I was. And all the socialization and child development that had left me with a very strong somebodyness, it cut that out. And of course, there was fear in losing that familiar identity. But there was always also wonder, because I touched a place in myself it was behind all my social roles. And it was, uh, it was a presence. Instead of being good or this or that or achiever or anything, I experienced a place in myself where I just say, I am. Not I am this or I am that, just I am. And I think it, it preoccupied me because it felt like it was my true being. And I felt like I was gypped. I was gypping myself not to have access to that. So I did what many others of you did and other people did, was I tried every chemical possibility to try to stabilize that state. I mean, if you took this and then followed it with this, and you did it under these conditions with this person, reading this book from the Tibetan, this, and you did it after fasting for so many days and standing on your left foot, it would work, see? And I still came down, and I kept coming down and coming down and coming down for about seven years, through hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of explorations. And then I went to India, and I met Maharaji, my guru, and I met a being who didn't come down. What I experienced at that time of meeting that man, in fact, within those first few minutes of meeting, was the experience of surrender, which was no surrender. In other words, I didn't begrudgingly give up my ego. It was as if I came home to the place where I no longer needed it. They took over my complete life at that point. I didn't leave that temple again except to go to Delhi once for seven months. They took over my food, my clothing, my training, everything. Never anybody asked or said. It was all done from then on from inside. I learned about what inside education is about. And this man was at the place where there was no other person you were giving up to. And everything I did from then on was done with absolute joy. There was no thing they could ask of me that was too hard. It was austerities that were not austere. Because I was living almost within this man. For the first time, I understood what the concept of a guru is about. You see, a guru is your doorway to God, your doorway to the beyond. A guru is not just a groovy teacher. You know, it's not a pundit. It's not just a wise man who can teach you things. A guru is a spiritual vehicle, an entranceway. He's a pure mirror. He isn't anybody at all. You're listening to sound from the new film, Becoming Nobody, about Ram Dass. And this is uh, also the title of the five CD set from Sounds True, because this is the essential teaching of Ram Dass about becoming nobody. And the film, I, I had listened to the five CD set uh, on several different occasions, and not all five CDs, of course. And every time I would listen, I would hear something new and and inspiring, thought provoking. And then the film, which I saw yesterday, was was 
it, well, it took it goes to another dimension altogether, and I trust that we will get there on the air today before we're out of time because it's a a piece of the film that was also essential to his life. And you you're beginning the the guy who is doing the interviewing, and in fact, is is the filmmaker is Jamie Cotto. He's a, a Brit, obviously. You can tell from his uh, accent, and he is a beginning filmmaker and. He, uh, Ramdas had meant so much to him when he was 20, and he had gone to this yoga retreat, and there he, there was Ramdas, and he had a girlfriend at the time who was pregnant, and uh, they since have married, and they have three children. This was the, their first, and it, he, it just changed his life, listening to this man talking as we're listening here today. And he goes to Hawaii, where Ramdas lived for the last years of his life uh, in uh, somewhat recovery from a massive stroke. Uh, his speech, as he was near the end of his life, is is not as swift and eloquent and articulate as you're hearing in his teachings from an earlier time of his life, but they are very potent. Their their chirs, and uh, I I appreciated that too. And his message, and at the end of his life, was about the end of life and what life is and what end means. And it it's it's really really wonderful. So uh, let me just again tell you that you can get your own copy of this film. On a DVD, but for a one hundred dollar donation to KPFA, one eight hundred four three nine five seven three two, one hundred bucks or ten dollars a month. You can also get the five CD set uh, from Sounds True, Becoming Nobody, The Essential Ramdas, for a two hundred dollar donation to KPFA, or twenty dollars a month. One eight hundred four three nine five seven three two, one eight hundred four three nine KPFA. Let's go back and hear some more from Becoming Nobody. This is from the film, 1-800-439-5732. I think that the spiritual trip in, at this moment is not necessarily a cave in the Himalayas, but it's in relation to the technology that's existing. It's in relation to where we're at. It's in relation to issues like pollution and... Uh, political interests and activism and stuff like that. I think that's all part of one package now. The game is to be where you are, be it honestly and as consciously as you know how. When we were all with Maharaji, I decided, well, he keeps saying, tell the truth and don't get angry. But the truth is, I am angry. And I've spent so long being phony like I love everyone. See, all the time my heart is full of anger. Oh, you're around us. Oh, yes, I love you. <laughs> and all the time I think, yeah, I wish such hell. <laughs> and that hypocrisy was driving me up the walls. And I thought, gee, he tell, said to tell the truth. I think for a change, I'll tell the truth. So people would come into my room and I would say, get the hell out of this room, you lazy. You're too nice. You nauseate me. You said something that I would love you to tell me about, about Maharaji saying, give up your anger. Don't work on your anger, don't work it through and find out the root. He just said, give it up. Yeah, he did say it that way. Give up your anger. Working it through is making them, making them something. The belief that... The belief. I'm righteous, I'm... Like, I have a right to be mad. That's not good. I keep Maharaji as a constant companion. So I, I get mad and I check in with him. And he, although he doesn't make me feel better, he just points it out. My Maharaji in my head is more like a psychiatric nurse. <laughs> if I don't 
get what I want, that's as interesting as if I get it, it turns out. Did you ever notice that? All this, I need you. Well, you're not getting me. Oh, ta you know, and then isn't that interesting? And then you grow from that. When you begin to realize suffering is grace, you can't believe it. You think you're cheating. It doesn't mean having no preferences. It means not being attached to your preferences. That's the one. If you don't get what you want, you don't get what you want. How interesting. Because the interesting process is the transformation, not getting what you want all the time. When I got out of my somebodyness, which was very cramped, I mean, it was like a prison to me. I didn't want to go back to prison. It's like you go out and you smell the air and then they say, okay, chemicals wearing off, back into prison. And you don't want to go. You say, no, no. But you go anyway. And you go back into your suit and you feel weird again. Now, because you know that that isn't who you are, but you're caught in it. So that starts quite a journey because my object was to get out of my suit. It was to get out of my physical, psychological identities, which felt extremely limited. And I would get incredibly free and high and clear and in love. Like I'd go to India and I'd sit in the temple or in meditation and I would get so high. Light was pouring out of my head. I was some combination of the pure mind of the Buddha and the heart of the Christ, which for a Jewish boy is not bad, you know, and I was really like... I'd be out there, you know, and I'd come back to the States and I'd go to visit the family. And my father would say a simple thing like, you got a job, and I'd crash. And I'd say, can't go home, brings me down. I began to have a whole list of things that brought me down. Cities brought me down. Money brought me down. Politics brought me down. But the only thing that brings you down is your own mind. It's not the city. The city is just sitting itself. It's being essence city. What are you getting so upset about? It's your reaction to the city that's what's doing it to you. And I found myself, interestingly enough, wearing a new kind of a suit. It was like, I'm very high. Don't get near me. Now, because I had felt so trapped by my body and my personality and was so unhappy in all of that, my job, it seemed, was to push away those things. And I tried a number of techniques like renunciation and figured if I just renounced all of it enough, it would go away. All I did was end up a horny celibate. It's like giving up smoking, like I haven't smoked in four years, two months, three days, and 22 minutes. A person will die from non-smoking. It didn't work. Because if you push something away, it still got you. You're busy not doing it. Every time you push anything away, it's still there. The pile under the rug gets very big. Yeah. So it gets so that your downs are actually far out without being masochistic. Your downs turn out to be more interesting than your highs after a while. Because they're showing you where you are, where you aren't. Like I get into a depression. Or like I got angry tonight. I was fascinated by that. Far out. Look at how I came in being a holy man. I lost my cool. Far out. Isn't that great? fascinating. You go out in the woods to look at trees. You don't say that pinion isn't as good as that redwood. You say, ah, a pinion. Ah, a redwood. You see a gnarled tree and you say, look at the beauty of that. You see a straight tree and you say, look at the beauty. You come back with humans. You never do that. If she were only a little, if he could only, I like them best when they're instead of, look at that. An absolute essence slimy liar. Somebody says something and it hurts you, and then you feel hurt. They did what they did because that's what they did. That's their problem. You reacted the way you reacted because that's the way you reacted. That's your problem. To interpret that your feeling is their problem is when you start to feel you have to tell them that you were hurt by what they said. 
The other thing is, if I'm hurt by what you say, that's something for me to work with. I acknowledge it and then I work with it. I don't have to get them to not do the thing because they're just being like a tree. They're just phenomena happening. It is said in the spiritual literature that righteousness and being right is one of the last gates to the inner temple. It's one of the last obstacles to getting in the inner temple. And that one of the problems of spiritual work is ending up being a good yogi. You are a really good yogi. You know all the slokas, shlokas, you know all the positions, you do it all perfectly right. You are really righteous and good, but you're not free. And it's called the golden chain, the chain of righteousness. When you want to become free, then your righteousness and your anger are much less interesting than they used to be. You less feel comfortable just sitting in your righteousness than you do in throwing it back into the pot in order to become free. Years back when I started to do this meditation 12 years ago, I could go off and I could have a six hour fantasy, a six hour sexual fantasy, sitting in Burma all by myself in a cell. I mean, and it was just with great detail and the subtleties of the rustle of silk and all the, you know, every little thing and the smells and the images and the shadows. And I just, what was the rush? I wasn't going anywhere. You know, I had weeks to meditate and I'd look like I was meditating all the time and they, nobody knew, you know, and I, I would have these six hour things, you know, it was like having an orgy of, or I'd plan when I became famous and, you know, I mean, I'd have those things. When I became like the Buddha, what would I do, you know, and I'd have long fantasies of what I would be, how compassionate I'd be. Oh, God. <laughs> to the extent that we were, went into somebody training, we work out of a sort of a um, deprivation model, a feeling like we're starving and we don't have enough and we want more, all right? So let's take love relationships. That's a good one. You fall in love with someone. That person awakens in you or allows you to touch the place in you where you are love. So you say, I am in love. And because that person did it for you, you say, I am in love with you. So you say to your connection, let's build a nest. And where will you be next Tuesday? And for the rest of our every Tuesday from here on out, and where were you last night? And who are you thinking about now? And you get terribly frightened that you're going to lose your connection. Because if you lose your connection, you won't feel that feeling any longer, which you're very hooked on. You begin to open to that place in yourself where you are love, which is the same as the one that's called awareness. It's the same thing. It's a feeling where you are one with the universe and you're liquid and flowing with everything around you. Now you are experiencing in love. And then after a while you say, well, I'm going down to the store to get some tofu and veggie burgers. <laughs> and you're at the checkout counter. You're still in love. You see, you're in this place because you're resting in it now. And you look into the eyes of the checkout person. And there it is again. Problem. Well, now what are you going to do? Are you going to look at anybody else? It's going to get complicated. You better start wearing glasses with mirrors facing inward because you got to start a commune. I mean, it's, you, what you're going to do sooner or later is you're going to have to let go of the model of deprivation that you've been functioning under. Because as you start to rest in this other space of your being, you're going to find this peculiar feeling that you're going to start to be in love with everybody. And you obviously can't collect them all. And you get to the point where you can walk down the street and look at somebody and love them like you've never loved anybody before. And you don't have to do a thing about it. At first, you can't believe it, you see, and you just want to save them in case you want them later. So you say, <laughs> like, who are you? My name's Dick. Hi, let's have dinner. Well, gee, oh, God, I hate to leave you, but I... Yeah. Then later, you just go and you go down the street and you go, hi, or ooh, or oh, do you feel what I feel? Or, and then after a while, you just walk down the street and you look at your lovers and you don't have to do anything about it because you're not going to run out. Hmm. 
not going to run out. Ram Dass, in this wonderful film, Becoming Nobody, and as one of the uh, folks says, this is not a movie you'll just see once. Uh, This is not a documentary you watch once. This is an ever-present guide star to help us find our way anytime we feel lost. Uh, the number here is 1-800-439-5732. If you would like to have this movie for yourself, we're just playing little bits and snippets of it uh, as we go through with Fun Drive. Uh, you can have it for a $100 donation to KPFA. 1-800-439-5732. 1-800-439-KPFA. We are also offering you the much more extensive uh, five-CD set of the same name, Becoming Nobody, the essential Ram Dass from Sounds True, uh, which includes uh, a number of meditation sessions. And he, when he talks about uh, awareness and, and coming to that place, uh, he recommends meditation as a, a way to get there. And the whole, what he, what uh, he was just talking about, about anger and righteousness, there's there's a great deal of that abroad in the land and the world uh, right now. Everyone is very angry, I think. There's a great deal of anger and a lot of it very righteous anger. And that, and, and certainly I've felt it myself. <laughs> no question. How could these people be so stupid? You know what I'm saying? So it, you, you get... It's, it, is, it is a matter of, because that doesn't go anywhere. That doesn't take you anywhere. And to get somewhere where it, there can be a positive change in the atmosphere, much less in the planet and in the politics, uh, it's going to take some very conscious effort on the parts of uh, those of us who... Uh, want to do so who are who are so ma- motivated and if you listen to Ramdas you're going to get real motivated number one and number two you're going to find out uh, methods t- that you can use that you can employ now and the five CD set once again is a $200 donation to KPFA or $20 a month and the DVD we're listening to the film today because I'm so glad that we finally have the film to offer you uh, of the same name Becoming Nobody that's a $100 donation to KPFA or $10 a month the curse of needing to be right needing to have the last word I catch myself in that with my grandson, and of course he is copying me, and then he has to have the last word, and you, it's just maddening. And and all you get is madder and madder and angrier and angrier. It's let it go, as he says. You go get to the awareness, which is the same as love, and then you you really do recognize your connection. That's what it is. It's a separateness that makes it so painful. Life so painful. And the connection is what he is talking about and what he is emphasizing. Once again, you're listening to this film, Becoming Nobody. Uh, Sharon Salzberg, one of my favorite Buddhist teachers, uh, she says, This is an exquisitely beautiful movie, both profound and funny, as befits a movie about Ram Dass. It is evocative not only of his remarkable life, but of a timeless path that invites us to learn to tell the truth, love unconditionally, and be free. And this is an historical document. It chronicles a uh, period of Ram Dass's life before his stroke and his teachings there, and also features an interview uh, in the very last months of his life in Hawaii after the stroke. Uh, Annie Lamott says this is a revelatory look through Ram Dass's decades of wisdom keeping. It will bring his vibrant truths, transmissions, stories, humanity, and humor to new generations. Get this film for yourself and for those you love. $100 to KPFA, 1-800-439-5732, 1-800-439-KPFA, or $10 a month. Uh, the five-CD set, Becoming Nobody, the Essential Ram Dass Collection, for yours for a $200 donation to KPFA. Oh, and I for- keep forgetting to mention Linda in San Rafael and Ava in Castro Valley with their $660. Let me see how we're doing on that front let's see 
Oh, good for you, Glennis. Glennis in, in Santa Cruz, you're going to love this CD set. Uh, Jewel in Sacramento, thank you so much. Uh, Ava in Merced uh, is going to uh, listen to Tyrant, Shakespeare on Politics, the inter interview that was featured by Mitch Jezerich. And here's Christopher in Oakland. You go. Uh, and he's he just loves everybody. He loves Avacha, Spliff, Tom Manzolini, Art Sato, Bonnie Simmons, David Gans, Mitch Jezerich, Khalil and Malihe, and Walter Turner. And he, he goes on and on. You go, Christopher. <laughs> That's the kind of listener that we've got, too. And that's the kind of pe people we have here on staff, both paid and un. So far, we've had five donors. Uh, oh, I was going to add up whether that's $660, huh? Let me see. Two, three, five. 525 75 uh, dollars will get us to six, 75 plus 60. Now I'm going to have to write it down, you know what I'm saying? Is $135. Okay, we're $135 short of meeting Linda and Ava's match of $660. Anything you pledge is worth double, just as uh, the uh, Ava who subscribed to get the, who called and donated in order to get the Shakespeare on Politics book. Uh, the whole list of all of our thank you gifts are on the website, kpfa.org and you can shop there. Uh, you can call the folks in the phone room. They'd be delighted to hear from you to help this in independent, commercial free, listener sponsored radio station. May you do the same. 1-800-439-5732. Every penny you donate is doubled right now. And I am thrilled to be offering you this wonderful film on DVD, Becoming Nobody, for your $100 donation or $10 a month. And the five CD set of the same title, Becoming Nobody, The Essential Ramdas. It's hours of teachings, including meditations, uh, guided meditations. That's yours for a $200 donation or $20 a month. Let's Let's go back and hear a little bit more from the film. 1-800-439-5732. Look at all the great saints. They're all as neurotic as anybody else. Uh, it's just that it's kind of irrelevant. And so you don't have to change your neuroses. You just stop identifying with them. And you just make friends with them and they come by for tea. A lot of people respond to that uncertainty and anxiety with fear. And the way they dissipate their fear, there's various strategies. One strategy is to just buy more stuff, to get more pleasure now because it's all going to be gone soon. That's one thing. That's the materialist strategy. There's another alternative, which is to feel that you will reduce the fear if you align yourself with good as opposed to evil. In other words, it's in the world of good and evil. And if you are part of the elect or part of the good guys and you push away the bad guys, somehow you will be protected from the uncertainties of the world. People grab on to a belief system which makes them feel that they are in the right and it reduces some of their anxiety. In order to hold on to that, they have got to convince themselves that other people are not in the right. They've got to polarize the world. And they create a lot of ours is the only way and if you don't do it, you're missing it and you're wrong. What you have to have is just a lot of compassion for the stages other people are in. And I would say that souls are neither good nor evil, that actions are good and evil, motivation is good and evil, that the personalities can be good or evil, but that the essence of a being is neither good nor evil, it just is. And it has heavy stuff to work out and good stuff to work out. And you begin to look at human beings as having very dark karma at times, very heavy stuff they're carrying with them that makes them project into the world in a way that creates immense suffering for other people. And there is a point in your being where you feel this incredible compassion for the horror of that predicament for that being. The minute you identify them with the acts that are creating the suffering, you lock them in to continuing to be who they are with your mind. So the art is to see actions as evil, but not beings. Yeah. 
you climb a mountain, you follow a path, you do any of the methods that you are attracted to, for example, quieting your mind or um, opening your heart, uh, like meditating or singing or going to church or service or whatever, or pitting the mind against the mind through Zen koans or whatever, all of it will push you and push you, but sooner or later you're going to have to, you'll get trapped by your methods. And they'll keep you asleep and you'll become a good meditator. Or, uh, you know, uh, I love Christ, but it'll be a sleep kind of statement. And then you'll have to let go of that one too. But all of these are useful techniques to keep working. And you've got to hear what your own technique is. Uh, the first thing is not to be bugged about going back to sleep. Just to experience that it was grace, that that, that that death allowed you to awaken for a moment. Because the minute you try to grab on to the memory of what it was, you're just holding on to an old dead butterfly. So you go back to sleep and then you wake up again. The fact that you're even asking that question is the awakening process at work. You have to stand back one step further and see your whole life, the awakening and the going to sleep all as awakening. Just get into a bigger time span and you'll be able to allow the dance to go on up and down and up and down. When I do all the things that I do every day, all of it is the stuff I use to work on myself in order to increase the equanimity and to increase the compassion. It all is exercise. Your entire life is curriculum. Everything you've got right on your plate is where the stuff for your enlightenment is. It's breathtaking when you stand back and see the beauty of that design. Mm -hmm. May it be so. It's so it's it's so encouraging and enlightening to hear that. And true. Because it's so true. Ram Das. It all every minute is the stuff of your enlightenment. Every minute. I appreciated the comments that we heard earlier in there about about polarization just because we're so living in that that, that moment right now of extreme polarization and to recognize that it is obviously from fear the fear of the deep uncertainties about the future about who is going to be if your group was a was a powerful group and all of a sudden it looks like it's not going to be uh that's a fear if if you have been if you in the past were able to pay your bills and now you can't that's a big fear uh, all just about loss a fear of loss and all of us have so much of that and and he then he talks about well and sometimes you go out and get more stuff sometimes you the images that I wanted to say this is a film so there's a lot of visuals which of course we cannot share on the radio uh, which is why it's so nice to have this five CD set because then you get everything in your ear here you've got something for your eyes as well and the image first of all there were images he talked about you know his his thing about putting on his suit the somebody suit there are images of him as a little little child uh, riding his tricycle and as a baby that he's got they've got all these old home movies and old photographs and everything of him and his siblings and his parents and uh, just and that's what's flashing behind him while he's talking about the somebody suit or not behind him but that's what you're seeing and then uh, this part here about polarization and uh, you have to see, you have to have compassion for the pain of others, especially others whose life path seems to be so, uh, he mentions karma, so dark that they are causing untold suffering for others. Uh, that you have to see their actions as evil but not their beings as evil. That is very, very difficult, uh, as I'm sure you know. Uh, and when when that is, uh, when he's saying that, then the images are, oh, of, uh, you know, tanks and people marching and people saluting and people in uniform and, and all that kind of stuff. 
it's it's very provocative. And then he says, or you could you could decide that you were going to uh, align yourself with the good. What you see is the good. And then he's got uh, religious figures. He's got a, some. It looks like Catholic Church or maybe High Episcopalian. Since I have not, I'm not an. I haven't ever done either one of those, so I don't really know what I'm looking at. But it's definitely some religious, uh, Western religious. Uh, costume and lights and you know candles and incense and all that stuff. It's the visuals really, really do help deepen uh, your experience. Of course, uh, we are offering you this this DVD, this film, Becoming Nobody, for a one hundred dollar donation to KPFA one eight hundred four three nine five seven three two one eight hundred four three nine KPFA, and also the five CD set. Becoming Nobody, The Essential Ram Dass. This is hours of material for $200 to KPFA or $20 a month. 1-800-439-5732. 1-800-439-KPFA. Many thanks to Kathleen in Sebastopol. And uh, Anonymous in Point Arena. And uh, let's see, Garth in Oakland. And Edmund and Richmond, many thanks. Oh, I love the thank you, Garth. He said when I came home and came home and tuned in, the snippet from Ramdas was exactly what I needed to hear. Amen. That's so true of so much of what he says. And you know what we what what moved me the most in this film, we haven't even gotten to yet, and maybe we will in this last little cut. And if we don't, then I will I will attempt to. Uh, say something about it, although it will be sadly uh, not as good as you will get from the film. 1-800-439-5732 1-800-439-KPFA The DVD Becoming you Nobody Yours for a $100 donation. Uh, when we finally see how much of our behavior is a defense mechanism to alleviate the pain of separateness we begin to realize the importance of healthy, intuitive, and compassionate hearts. So you are working on strengthening your heart and strengthening the access that you have to your heart, to your intuition and your compassion. And once you have started to awaken, this is the good news, you can't turn back. You can't lose the progress you've already made. This is very reassuring to me, for example. <laughs> I felt I felt like I was totally solid with my meditation practice. You know, it was an hour a day and and retreats, and then then what? We got evicted or something? You know, something some major and moving and and uh, changes in life, and uh, I've lost my my routine. And that's what he says, too, is you don't have to manipulate your own life. It will change automatically. <laughs> that's no kidding. As you cultivate the witness and intention within yourself, you can always do that, no matter what was coming. So, the film. Once again, $100 to KPFA. We have made the $660 match, I, I hasten to say. We have made the match. Thank you to Linda in San Rafael and Ava in Castro Valley for your $660 challenge. 1-800-439-5732. 1-800-439-KPFA. And online at kpfa.org. We just have a tiny bit left here of Becoming Nobody, the film. Here it is. I've got one delicious sign I tell us every lecture because it's such a delicious image. It's at a time when everybody that came into my audience is always the same age and they all dressed a certain way. They all wore white and had smiles and had flowers and were, you know, they were, we love everybody, you know, they were real repressed anger. So, um, This one night, they uh, they were all there smiling, and I was, uh, we, well, I assumed everybody had, had acid, and we were all just, I was talking far out talk, you know. And there was a woman sitting down in the front who was about 70, and she had a hat on with oranges and cherries and things, and she had a, a black patent leather bag and a print dress and responsible Oxfords. I think I've conveyed the type. And she was sitting there, and I'd say these outrageous things, and she'd go like this, you see. <laughs> And I think, how does she know? You know, 
this is not an acid head. I mean, I just kept, and I kept looking at her, and I'd say more outrageous things than look, and she'd go like this. You know? So at the end of the lecture, I kind of um, smiled her up. <laughs> she came up and she said, oh, thank you. She said, everything you said was just made perfect sense, and it was just so clear. And I said, how do you know all that? What do you do that gets you into the position of consciousness that you know all this? She leaned forth very conspiratorially and she said, I crochet. See, now that's what I'm talking about. Whatever works. <laughs> Absolutely. And it's true. Crocheting, hey, any of that. I love it. Uh, and that wasn't what I wanted him to say. <laughs> <laughs> the part that got me so much, and I think it's because of uh, events, and obviously it's because of events in my own life. I have uh, my brother had a, had a heart attack. I have a dear, dear friend who was part of the Freedom Summer that's uh, battling cancer. So what I found very moving in this film was how much he spoke, especially probably near the end of the film. He talks about death and dying and how it is it, it was so i can't tell you what he said i i'm sorry i i can't but he he was so um so good about it and he's been working on this for many many years obviously and um i'm trying to look right now into uh, the article that the new york times wrote about uh, ramdas is not afraid of dying he d he did die of course just in december uh of uh, 2019 and he said soul doesn't have a fear of dying ego has a very pronounced fear of dying the ego this incarnation is life and dying the soul is infinite <clears throat> And that's enough, but that's all I can tell you. But he's not afraid of dying because his whole message about uh, become, becoming nobody, um, that's where you start, where you are connected to everything, whether you are alive or dead. It's so moving in the film, and I so, I so regret that I'm mangling it here and not, not convincing you. You're going to have to find out for yourself. When you call 1-800-439-5732, 1-800-439-KPFA, and get yourself this beautiful, beautiful film, uh, Becoming Nobody, uh, on DVD for a $100 donation to KPFA. Uh, we have just moments left uh, before we'll be out of time for this particular thank you gift offer today. Uh, the uh, two-CD set, which we've played before to you, is absolutely marvelous. And well worth the $200 donation to KPFA or $20 a month. 1-800-439-5732. 1-800-439-KPFA. Uh, you will be so happy to have this film. And of course, there's colors and flowers. And, and you get to have, he's smiling. And through all of these uh, periods in his journey... Uh, that he talks about he's 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 there dancing in the grass with somebody and he's he's there in front of an audience he's he's sitting in meditation posture or he's uh, standing in front of a microphone and he tells so many stories on himself about uh, how he blew it and he was he tells one story about being you know the featured lecturer and he's coming to dispense wisdom and he gets up there and finds out that they haven't given him the kind of microphone that he has demanded. And he's very testy. <laughs> so it's a never-ending, never-ending process. Uh, and maybe he should take up crochet, except that it's a little late for him, but it's not too late for you. 1-800-439-5732. Uh, this is the core arc of his teachings and life. Uh, the bridge, the unique bridge that he became between Eastern and Western philosophies as as much of uh, the New Age movement m went there. And then there was Barry, uh, the meditation center there, Insight Meditation established and out here, Spirit Rock, and it sort of has blossomed 
and and then there's meditation on the cover of Time magazine, you know, like or mindfulness, whatever they mean by that. It's a good thing, this Eastern-Western combination. But if you want to go into it deeply, as he obviously did, he tried everything and finally got to a place where he felt that he was getting somewhere. He was becoming enlightened. He was shedding his ego. 1-800-439. He's, run, he's worn many hats on his journey, and that journey is narrated here. It explores our universal human condition and behaviors in connection to the journey of the soul and, most importantly, the shared unity of all of our lives and how we all are, are part of this that life is, the life force is, is love, and it's all of us, and even the ones we don't like. And to have compassion for each other and the difficulties that are presented in each one's journey. And it helps to hear the, the story of, of this man's journey. And then it will help to hear, to think of your own journey. 1-800-439-5732, 1-800-439-KPFA, and online at kpfa.org. We are living at a time where um, it is now beginning to be acceptable to consider the possibility that people actually die. <clears throat> Usually in our culture, it has been put behind doors, behind sheets, behind, you don't talk to the children about it, you don't show anybody uh, we surround people that are dying with a certain kind of falseness that comes out of our own fear when my mother my oh, my natural mother was dying and um, I'd watch people come into the room all the relatives and doctors and nurses saying you're looking better you're doing well and then they go out of the room and say she won't live the week and I thought how bizarre that a human being is going through one of the most profound transitions in their life and they're surrounded completely by deception. Can you hear the pain of that? That nobody could be straight with them because everybody was too frightened, even the rabbi, all of them, everybody, everybody. And for me who has uh, grown up in that culture, it was quite an experience when I started to live in India where when somebody dies, they are put on a pallet and then carried through the streets to the burning grounds and the death is public for everybody to see the body is right there it's not in a box it's not hidden most people are dying at home so that most people as they grow up have been in the presence of someone dying while in our culture an amazing number of people even at middle age, have never been in the presence of someone dying. They have walked away from it and hidden from it. Dear friend, please know as you pass by, as you are now, so once was I. As I am now, so you will be. Prepare yourself to follow me. And we are preparing ourselves. I'm one of the strange people that absolutely delights and enjoys being with people as they're dying. In fact, it is as such incredible grace for me that in the morning when I know I'm going to be with such a person, I get absolutely uh, thrilled in my body, my being. Because I know I'm going to have an opportunity to be in the presence of truth. May it be so. It's so. It's it's so encouraging and enlightening to hear that and true because it's so true. Ram Das. Let me just again tell you that you can get your own copy of this film on a DVD, but for a one hundred dollar donation to KPFA, one eight hundred four three nine five seven three two, one hundred bucks or ten dollars a month. You can also get the five CD set uh, from Sounds True, Becoming Nobody, The Essential Ramdas, for a two hundred dollar donation to KPFA or twenty dollars a month, one eight hundred four three nine five seven three two. My name is Richard Wolf. Whatever else you think about them, these are times of big change. 
And at a time of big change, nothing could be more important than having some genuinely independent public media sources like KPFA. These are unbelievably important institutions at this particular time. So if you've never contributed before, now is the time to do it. Donate today at 1-800-439-5732 or online at kpfa.org. Betty Lou Cutter. Douglas Brent Roden. George Marcus. Valerie 